Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might just become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, as usual, and my lovely partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a lovely chat room, Ravinder. Tell us all about it, please. We have a fabulous chat room. It's just a great group of people. They all contribute somewhat to, you know, the discussion on hand. So I'm always learning something new and I like learning new stuff and broadening my horizons. And uh, so I do hope you can join us too and then I can learn from you as well. So that is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. All right. In this week's spotlight, I would like to address the subject of communication. It seems that it is more and more difficult to communicate with others today. Often this is due to emotionally charged positions that are altogether too easy to affront. It seems that folks often symbolize ideas in ways that lead to further communication issues. That is, all sorts of mental images are wrapped up with certain constructs, such as those found in politics. Take, for example, the word symbol Republican. And for some, there is a sometimes hateful resentment that arises, while for others there's a warm, fuzzy feeling. The problem here is that instead of examining issues one by one in isolation for their merit, people will often dig in, either in support or opposition, just because of what this word symbol represents to them. The same can be true with all forms of communication in conversations as diverse as relationships to health and wellness. Think for a minute about what the word symbol vegan means to you. For some, this expresses weak-minded folks who are the self-appointed social workers for animal rights. They are definitely not the world-class boxers, weightlifters, endurance runners, and so forth. After all, doesn't everyone know that it's meat, milk, eggs, and cheese that are the real protein builders, and don't we all need protein? Now, the facts are quite different from the symbol that can be elicited in this definition. There are indeed world-class athletes who are vegans. Framing is often a problem in communication. One of my favorite examples of the power of framing exists in the Susan Boyle story. Susan appeared on Britain's Got Talent in a circa 50s house dress and somewhat overweight and disheveled. The audience saw her and began to laugh, jeer, etc. The judges looked at one another, rolling eyes and expressing dismay for the obvious failure at pre-screening the talent. However, when she opened her mouth and began to sing, everyone became silent in astonishment, for the most mellifluous of sounds emitted from this unlikely-looking singer. But that's exactly the point. What makes us think a singer is supposed to look a certain way? Word symbols often frame a context, and communication can be blinded by the difference people assign to their symbols. Two people can agree on a word symbol, such as democracy, only to discover that they really disagree when they flesh out the meaning that they have in their mind of what this term may mean. We also have styles of information processing. Some of us are inferential while others are literal and direct. As such, an inferential can hear a compliment like, my, you look good today, and think to themselves something like, what, didn't I look good yesterday? A literal person can hear a comment such as, the door should be closed, and they will get up and close it, while an inferential may look over and think to themselves, yeah, it probably should be closed. As such, the way we process information can further exacerbate problems in communication. 
I've spoken to many experts about this communication problem, ranging from men like Dan Ariely, who points out how frequently we lie to each other, to John Gray, author of Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. What I discovered is a universal agreement on one aspect of our communication issues. We don't listen well or enough. We are ever to bridge the if we are ever to bridge the communication divide, we must first patiently and attentively learn to listen. And then instead of providing some answer that we have thought of before, instead of trying to be a fixer, instead of coming up with what we're going to say before they have even concluded speaking, Inquire instead more and allow the speaker to fully flesh out their ideas and thoughts. Only once we understand the real meaning behind communication efforts will we be able to begin to respond intelligently and with compassion. Until then, two people may continue to speak to one another only to have both go away upset and or thinking, he, she doesn't understand me. My thoughts anyway, what are yours, Ravinder? Of course, it's a really important subject right now, you know, with the way the country's divided and the way everything um, is going on. Just for your information, my definition of vegan means a, compa a caring, compassionate person who is strong enough to defy societal norms. Okay, it's my definition and that is what I'm sticking to. Um, yeah, I have my own little bias there too, so... So what? Um, when it comes I to... I can see you trying to have a, a conversation. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but your definition and their definition, the two of you, you, you just made my point. I know. You're never going to be able to communicate about the issues because your definitions have I framed know. you in such a hard, fast position that you're going to be defending that position. It is. You're right. That's I, crazy. I cannot argue with you on that once you know at all but where it was going to go to next you know you have the story about Susan Boyle and you say what makes us think a singer should look a certain way well that answer becomes a little bit easier because that is down to enculturation um, I'm from India and Indian music you know comes from the movies and stuff and so they often dub in the singer over the actor or the actress because they can't sing so I'm very familiar with the idea that singers the, the finest singers tend not to be attractive at all or off in lots of instances they are just not attractive so I don't think that way but then I've been enculturated a little bit differently but back to you know all the problems that are going on in in that country today with all the divisions well that's all a bit of enculturation dependent upon the small groups that you move around in. So I would encourage everyone to, you know, move out of your own groups, talk to other people, actually hear them, give them the benefit of the doubt as opposed to, you know, packaging their views all based on a word symbol, as you so rightly started off with. So can you do that with veganism? <laughs> all right. Every week I read some of your letters. <laughs> Our way of involving you while well, paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week, we hosted Professor Andy Malinsky, and we discussed his book, Reach. Tamara wrote, I really loved your show with Professor Malinsky. I found it very helpful. I have been stuck in my own comfort zone and needed to hear his message. Thank you for so many great programs. Tanya wrote, I bought this book right away. We all have comfort zones, and reaching beyond them can be among the most challenging things we face in life. I so agree, Tanya, especially when it comes to veganism. I'm teasing you. I can't resist. Mark commented, Andy Malinsky's method presumes that the individual is proactive, has a certain amount of free will, and can willingly grow in life toward a goal. Well, you know, that's very true, Mark. But I think many people miss the depth implied in your remark because they make assumptions about free will, goal orientation, and so forth that are false to fact. The bottom line is, um, you know, we're often unconsciously, as you recognize, uh, directed, and uh, we have to deal with that before we really can reach beyond our comfort zones. Richard had this to say about comfort zones. Have you ever had to stand in front of a room of people and confront the gestalt of the whole place? 
Wow, doing that had me shaking with fear. I know, Richard, you told me about this, and you did very well, and uh, my congratulations. Moving on, Gabriel wrote, your products are really effective. Jagir wrote, I have many Intertalk CDs, and they are great. Cheryl wrote, I used one of your CDs to get through nursing schools. All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by emailing me at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at EldonTaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook. We sincerely appreciate your comments and feedback. Um, indeed, we we need them. You know, send them to me. I, I, I never get enough of them, so keep them coming. Okay, today's guest on the show is E.A. Barker, author of the entertaining and insightful new book, Ms. Creant, The Wrongdoers, Life with Women, The Long-Awaited Instruction Manual. E.A. shares 24 appropriate sto- inappropriate stories of life with women in this instructive and humorous read. The author based these stories of women behaving badly on his real-life experience. His copy states the following, quote, By writing about many of the most difficult issues facing mankind with a pinch of humor, it was my hope that a conversation would be started that could spread awareness. Men need a better understanding of both themselves and women. Women need a better understanding of both themselves and men. Both sexes need to see the world for what it is if we are to create change. We cannot allow the goal of true equality to be corrupted by political correctness or reverse discrimination. Close quote. This promises to be somewhat irreverent and at the same time informative. I've been looking forward to this one, so on that, let's get him in. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. E.A. Barker. Hello there. <laughs> How are you today, my friend? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. You know, I'm listen. A big fan. I want, just want to say off the top, I am a big fan of uh, your blog that I get in my email. And uh, if, if there are people listening, this man can write, and, and that needs to be said. Well, thank you very much, EA. I appreciate it. You, you did a great job with yourself writing. Your, your book is really, it, it's humorous, it, and it's instructional, and as I say, it's irreverent at times. It's, uh, you know, it, it is a fun, fun read. But, you know, we like to know three things from, you know, the people that join us on the show. One is, of course, who is the messenger? What is the message? And, of course, how do we use it? So begin by telling us, what motivated you to write Miss Creant? It, it came in it came in waves. Um, it began. Uh, I had two young nephews in their early twenties, and they were getting into serious relationships and getting into serious relationship problems. <laughs> and I thought, okay, um, I have a long history, and I have a semblance of a memoir, and I, I started writing it. Just for them, to be honest, um, it, it was something where these, you know, young clueless guys um, with a little bit of guidance c- could maybe do a better job in their relationship. So that's where it began. Where the writing journey took me was was to a, a place that I didn't expect to go, and uh, essentially, it, it it became apparent to me that. We are not uh, doing well as a civilization. Humanity itself is not doing well. And I've always been one to ask the simple question, why? And I started coming up with some ideas and ultimately perhaps nailed down a few answers in the book. Um, It's my belief that the patriarchy that has existed for 3,000 years is not working, cannot work, and cannot continue. And we are at this point, and we're very close, at least in Western civilization, to where we can bring the other half of the population into the conversation. And by the other half, I'm speaking of women. 
Um, men have ruled this planet for far too long, and they've done a bad job of it. And we need to we need to not only um, uh, invite women into our conversations and into our boardrooms, but we have to go a little bit further, and we have to start building better women from the ground up. Um, we have to parent better, and we have to educate better. All right, let's get some frivolity out of the way. Miscreant is really a play on words, based on one word. Flesh this out for us, and why this title? Well, because the stories contained in it are the worst women I ever knew, or are of the worst women I ever knew. The, there's 24 of them. As they behave rather badly, and I chronicled those stories. They're in the book. But they're there mostly to allow the reader, moving from one story to another to another with the analysis that comes afterwards, it's almost a case study type of thing. They're, those stories are there to show patterns. In other words, throughout 24 stories, there is a pattern. And when we get further on in the book, and I'm not going to give out any spoilers today, uh, the reader will see us reaching some conclusions and, and about society, about civilization. And we will, um, we will have armed them to follow, you know, to, to follow that line of reasoning. Uh, right to the end. So creant stands for? Well, a, a miscreant is a wrongdoer, and miscreant is the uh, title of the characters that are described in the 24 stories. So the name, if you will, of the, the wrongdoer. Women. We've got a little self-disclosure going on in the book. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> EA, I, I have to ask you this now. Uh, you also use a pseudo name, right? Or, yeah, I, I mean, okay, so here we are. We have a subtitle to the book, a daring one, The Long-Awaited Instruction Manual for Life with Women. <laughs> and a guy that writes it that hides behind an anonymous name. So I've got to ask you, do you really think you figured the female species out well enough to guide others with women in their lives? Well... I don't want to paint a target on, on my back. So the, <laughs> the reality check is that uh, the social circles um, that, you know, I'm, I'm still attached to contain some of the women described in the book. And it would be best if they never found it. <laughs> um, I can't guarantee that will, that will be the case, but I'm certainly not about to, you know, announce into all the circles of my past, that this book exists and that there are stories about you. So <laughs> um, the, the, the best way to deal with it was to leave out uh, just anything that could identify any one person. And by keeping the name that I go by in, in regular day-to-day -day living away from the book, I, I'm able to both protect the the people described in the book as well as any <laughs> any chaos that might ensue at a book signing. Having read some of the stories, I can appreciate that. But I, you know, since Miss Creant is a play on words, uh, I have to ask you, E. A. Barker. You know why E. A. What's that all about? Those are my initials. So Say that again. My, I missed my, it. My, my given name. Uh -huh. Okay, so and first name and last name, those are my initials. Oh, they are. So yeah. for anyone listening that might know of someone who well, did some like wrongdoing you. to some yeah, woman. A, a, a fellow like you, but you see, the, the, there, the, there's a Bob Robert thing in play as well. So, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of off the hook that way. Okay. Um, but uh, for a criminologist like yourself, 
I, I mean, it would not be that hard to figure out who I am and, <laughs> and where I am. Um, okay. For, for most of the women described in the book, it would be far more difficult. You think you're safe? I have to uh, ask I'm you, hoping. are you married? No, I'm and if, No, you're not. Okay, so you don't have to worry about your wife ratting you out or whether or not she agrees <laughs> yeah. on the book. Yeah, uh, you always run into that situation. It's like, you do not dare make that person too too angry. So. <laughs> okay, in your view, women are a mass of conflicting impulses. Flesh well, that, that out for us. What do you mean by was, that? That was stolen from Star Trek, and uh-huh. it's noted in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, there, there, there is a certain truth to that. Um, a, a woman that does not understand her own biology, a woman that does not understand, uh, have an understanding of, of human behavioral, uh, characteristics is someone that, you know, is going to be a mass of conflicting impulses. And it's the same is true for men. Uh, the single biggest difference uh, between men and women is that we have swings. We have hormonal swings, just as women do. Um, but because of testosterone, things are a little different for us. And the frequency at which these occurrences happen is very different. Uh, so in the book, with the research I did over a period of a year, it, it appears as though women go through, women will change 10 times as many times in a lifetime as a man will. And that's a significant number of biological changes. Let's just go to a chapter of yours and see if I can, I can flesh out this conflicting impulses a bit more. In your chapter titled, The Soul of a Woman Was Created Below... <laughs> Again, that, which is a rather uh, provocative title to say the least what do you mean well, by that you know again that one there and this is part this is part of the humor that i attempted to do inject into the book by using quotes from a huge variety of, of sources i i mean there there's greek philosophers uh making quotes about women there's uh, rock bands in that particular case that that was from Led Zeppelin. Um, you know, there's Rodney Dangerfield. There's just there. There's in order to make it an entertaining read for men, I injected all of the the commentary uh, of, of these. You know, uh, of coming from a, a wide variety of of different sources into each and every chapter where I could. Okay, well, that's uh, all well and good, but do you think that the soul of a woman comes from below? Oh, well, you would have to, first of all, believe in a below. (laughs) (laughs) So, and and then we'd get into a whole different conversation. (laughs) So, if if I get you right, what you're doing is you're juxtaposing very often your humor with the real message, the principle behind why you wrote the book. Yeah. Um, I, I attempt to be a fairly light guy living in a very serious world. And uh, one of the most distressing things I found out, and I do have a note here somewhere about this, which I'm scanning for. Sorry to do that. Oh, here it is. This is why I wrote a book for men, and it's uh, these are some reading, reading stats which are just absolutely, they, they floored me. 33% of high school graduates never read another book for the rest of their lives. 42% of college graduates never read another book after college. 80% of U.S. families did not buy or read a book last year. Seventy percent of U.S. adults have not been in a bookstore in the last five years. Fifty percent of new books are not read to completion. The number of public library items checked out daily is three million, which equals one percent of America's population. I'm familiar with that kind of data. 
Um, and I do find it's uh, most unfortunate. Uh, and, and, you know, well, the other it, side of the coin everything. is we're publishing more books now than we've ever published in history. Uh, so even if you're an avid reader, it's kind of hard to keep up with it. All right, listen, we've got a hard break coming up, EA. <clears throat> when I come back, I want to know how marriage changes a man. You've got quite a bit of input regarding that. We're speaking with E.A. Barker about his book, Miss Creant, The Wrongdoers. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at Miss, M.S. Creant, C-R-E-A-N-T, Miss Creant dot E.A. Barker dot com. Now, we have a video for you in our chat room featuring seven ways to make a woman's day. So if you're not in the chat room already, now is the time to get on over there. And you can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. New scientific research has repeatedly demonstrated that the power of your mind can do wonderful things if you believe in yourself. Indeed, it can literally change the brain, increasing cognitive abilities, rewiring connections, and even adding gray matter. And all you have to do is invest a little time in tuning your mind. The perfect toolkit for just that is the patented and proven effective InnerTalk technology. InnerTalk changes the way you talk to yourself, and that changes everything. For when you truly believe in yourself and your own abilities, magic happens. InnerTalk has over 300 programs to choose from, ranging from health and wellness to prosperity and success, from accelerated learning to relationships, from habits and addictions to spirituality. Remove the doubt and fear now. Go to InnerTalk.com today. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Alvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Mr. E.A. Barker about his book, Miss Creant, The Wrongdoers. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at miscreant.eabarker.com. Now we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some true significance to them. Music psychology is, after all, a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. Social behavior. So we just played some of Alice Cooper's No More Nice Guy. Tell us, EA, why is this music important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? Well, I, I think what it is, is, is it really says more about the book. Um, I didn't pull any punches. Uh, when talking about women, when talking about uh, North America, when talking about, uh, you know, Western civilization and, and, and the global populace. I didn't pull any punches at all. And that, in our politically correct society, is a no-no. So I think that's why the music fits. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Okay, so it also speaks, of course, about the fact that you didn't pull any punches. So you may say or defer it's about the book, but I guess it's a little bit about you too, isn't it? Oh, I, I mean, there, there's no question. <laughs> you're, you're an author. You know exactly what it's like. The stuff that comes out of us is a, is a part of us. And uh, it, it, the only thing that we really have to do is, is we just have to get a I either edited ourselves or find a good editor that can tell us when we've gone too far. Amen. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you, uh, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but, okay, you know, if the guy on the corner street and those shabby clothes that are dirty with, you know, holes in them is hawking a millionaire program and all he wants me to do is pay him to attend... Uh, I'm a little dubious. Now, you're offering a lot of advice to men. 
but you're single. You're not married. Have you been married before? I mean, how did you well, come by your I mean, advice? In, 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 a legal, in a legal sense, um, it, here in Canada, you're married when you've lived with a woman for a year. Okay. So, it, you know, it, have I been at, you know, have I attended a church wedding? Absolutely not. Uh, but, you, but you've been a serial monogamist. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, that's, that, that's, I've attempted to. I, and I haven't been particularly successful. <laughs> uh, as the book chronicles. Uh, okay, but we can learn from other people's mistakes. And, Absolutely, and I've learned from many of the lessons of the past. All right, okay. You offer a series of warnings to your fellow men about women, such as you know when your buddy says, "Oh, you have my blessings to take this girl. You can be with her all you want," and you say that probably means trouble. Please, you know, share with us some of these warnings and your thinking behind them. <laughs> Jeez. I, I, I wish I wish I had a glimpse of the book um, prior to doing this. The, any warnings that, it, that exist in the book were based on real life experience, again, chronicled in the 24 story. Um, so, yes, uh, are there patterns? Definitely. And are there... Um, you know, are, are there, are there, are women capable of things that we men may not be capable of? And that is a possibility. Um, when it, when it comes to the D words that I, that I, um, talk about in the book, uh, you know, deception, uh, deviousness, and there's quite a long list, uh, there are very few of us, men or women, that that could deny that uh, they have either been that person or know that person. So, really, what the what we're doing is is we're we're looking at the complete package of a typical woman. No, not every woman is going to fall into you know into into uh, the box that I've created, but the vast majority are covered in the book. Yeah, and they're cute ones, you know. Um, I do enjoy your humor about uh, how you you discuss them, you know. Uh, some of them, women are like dogs. You don't reward them for bad behavior. <laughs> <laughs> They, uh, yes, they're I'm quoting so from page 135 when I, I yeah. happen to have your book right here, looking at them. Uh, you know, some of them are pretty obvious and some of them uh, have more instructional value, but I can see why you yeah. want to well, hide. There is, a, there is a little context to the one that you just managed to riff off of. All um, right, well, throw us the context. Well, you know the, that that particular one was was a case of a, a bunch of people sitting around drinking far too much and a conversation ensued. So that's uh, that is the type of thing. And again, you know, I don't hide my own bad behavior, professing to be some kind of know-it-all. Um, what I do <clears throat> is I allow other people to explore both the behavior of myself and the partner that I had at the time. And come to their own conclusions. They, they they can use it and say, oh, my God, we've done that, and, and not do that in their own relationships. You know, they have an opportunity to learn about relationships from this book. They have an opportunity to learn about human behavior, uh, about biology, um, even, you know, uh, uh, basically, you know, when you write a book about life, it should be an entire life. And this one is laid out by decade initially, and it covers the beginning to the end. And all the things, all the significant life events we're likely to run into. You, during your research, you had to have some fun. I mean, in science, we call that a participatory observation. I mean, you were actually participating in interviewing and talking to the opposite sex is, you know, I'm sure as well as some other men. Um, tell us about that. What was that like? I mean, when you when you said, I'm doing this research for the book, or did you do it all undercover? Uh, 
to be honest, uh, the vast the the vast majority of it was me trying to figure out how I got where I was and uh, where I was going to head next. So I I had these stories pretty much written, and the stories only make up about half of the pages in the book. Everything else is my trying to find out, you know, some trying to find some understanding as to what had happened and what. So I, I think, it, you know, that might be the, the key to this, which is the idea that every one of our heartbreaks, you know, um, needs to be looked at in order to let it go. And it also needs to be analyzed so we don't repeat the same behavior. Tell us about the big M. Oh, I'm drawing a blank. Can you give me more? <laughs> oh, we're talking about menopause. Okay, now I remember. It's been a while since I wrote the book, and it's been a, you know. <laughs> um, yes, the big M. The, the the thing that women will deny exists until it's upon them when they could be doing things to uh, reduce its impact on their lives prior. Uh, that is very much discussed in the book. There's one chapter dedicated to it and several other chapters that touch on it. Um, I did a lot of research. Uh, I am not a biologist, nor am I a doctor. But... Uh, the research came from a, a, a good source, and uh, pr- uh, primarily, uh, not exclusively, but primarily. Um, oh my goodness, I, I'm 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 blanking on my my favorite book about menopause. <laughs> uh, right in the front of the book, that one of us should have open. <laughs> um. Oh, my goodness. This would only happen on the radio. You'd think of it, I know, very easily if we didn't have you in a hot spot here on the, you know. Yeah. You're thanks. talking about wanna... Northrop? Yes, thank you. Chris... Christine You're thinking Northrup. Of? Yeah, yeah, there you go. The Wisdom okay. of Menopause. That was a book that I read to try and answer some questions about, I believe it was Ms. Grant 20. Two-ish, um, a woman had befriended me, and she was going through all kinds of chaos. This is a woman that had, uh, you know, a degree in psychology, and yet she could not see what was happening to herself. She could not understand her own behavior, and and it just fascinated me to no end to the point where I thought I needed to know more. So so the research began there. And, of course, Christian Northrup is, is uh, an, a medical doctor. And the yes. big M is uh, menstruation? Menopause. Menopause. Okay. So this is uh, just a, a period at, uh, at at one point in their life, not something that occurs on a monthly basis. No, no, no. No, there's um, what we're talking about basically is is most women, you know, um, are not aware uh, of the different types. Most women are not aware that how early it can actually begin to affect them, and uh, and and they really wait till the you know um, or how it messes with neurochemistry and emotions well, yes, and da da da. Yes. Right. When, when right. they gotcha. when they when they've reached the point um, where there is a real imbalance in hormones. Right. Um, it's affecting their behavior. It's affecting their brain chemistry, and and then there's this frantic move to okay, maybe we need some hormone replacement therapy or something like that. And typically that goes awry because most family physicians uh, have just don't have a handle on this. Uh, the testing that's required to do it uh, properly. Uh, needs to be done over a, 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 a significant period. It's not a one-time test, and there's your pill. And so there's 
a great deal of information in order for us to understand women, in order for women to understand themselves. Good. I just wanted to um, flesh guess, that out so that our audience was clear on what you were referring to by the big M. I have to ask you this, and I don't mean to hurry you along, but I've got a lot of questions here. And you've got a really interesting no book, and some of it is funny, and some of it is informative, as I've said before. Some of it is just plain irreverent. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, tell me why men die 10 years earlier than women. Because we want to. I mean, when we put up with this long enough, <laughs> it just becomes a case of take me now. <laughs> um, it, it's again that is that is a little bit of my twisted humor that that is injected <laughs> into the book. Yeah, um, a little bit. But uh, you know, there there is a serious side to this book. This is the, you know, and essentially, my my hope was I could get men reading that I could get people to lighten up a little. Um, we, we're, we're living in very serious times and very dark times, and it's very easy to get dragged down by that. We have an opportunity to find some happiness, possibly, you know, with a partner, and definitely capable of finding happiness without a partner. So and you're not serious. You're not seriously suggesting that women drive us crazy and we just want out of here. And that's why we go <laughs> 10 years earlier. Again, you know, there, 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 there's probably uh, somebody out there that can tell you why men go more quickly. <laughs> but, if, but if the answer comes out as being stress, work-related stress, uh, then why aren't we bringing, you know, um, sharing that burden. In other words, in other words, the, the old norms of, you know, wife at home, perhaps with a part-time career while I'm the real breadwinner, those days need not exist today. And, um, you know, we can have a, a, an, an equality in a relationship. We can have equality in the workplace. Um, that's never been achieved before in, in human history. And, and we're close. We're, we don't have a lot of work to do to get there. Uh, essentially, the book was, it was a, 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 a book that could have been a textbook, but who wants to read that? It could have simply been um, a memoir, but there's lots of those. And what I attempted to do was cook up something that would entertain men to get them reading, that would inform women, and would be something that could even be used um, in a very open-minded classroom. So it, it covers everything, um, every aspect of our lives, um, pairing up. It, it talks about... Uh, our earliest attraction. It talks about uh, settling. It talks about education. It talks about parenting. It talks about growing old. So anyhow, let's talk about Elvin. Um, I'm a big fan of his writing and uh, absolutely fascinating character that I only came upon in the last year since doing this book. Uh, Everything that I've read tells me that uh, we have a fair bit in common in terms of our philosophical bent. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, are, you, are, are we talking now? Yeah, yeah, you did really well with your monologue. We lost the network. <laughs> we lost no the station. Idea where to go. <laughs> yeah. We lost the station there for a minute, and we had to retrain the modems in order to reconnect. Uh, but at any rate, we're reconnected. Uh, and thank you very much for carrying the ball. huh? Well, I, uh, I attempted. You type women such as women with high IQs. Why type them? And please share, you know. What's the difference in the types? So what types should we be looking for for men? Oh my. What types should women hide if they don't want us to discover it? If only it were that easy. 
Um, again, there's a lot of tongue in cheek uh, to this book, <laughs> and and that particular uh, portion was definitely an add in tongue in cheek section. Um, yes, I have had experiences with a variety of different types of women. Um, you know, uh, you, you 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 date one and and end up heartbroken uh, by a particular type, and you decide for yourself, well, self, I'm going to go out and I'm going to try something totally different and expecting a different result. But all too often the result isn't different, or if it is different, it's not different and better. So what few minor discoveries I have made in the, in, in the world of understanding women the serious ones are to do with biology, to do with human behavioral characteristics. The not serious ones are just my own ridiculous observations, and those are the ones that were just intended really for this for its humorous value. Uh, they are definitely they definitely are humorous. I mean. Uh, but, but I think, it, you know, a guy picks this book up. I did. I said, I don't mean to speak for all guys. I'll just speak for myself. You pick this book up and you start, you know, reading some of these things and you say, really, is that true? <laughs> and then you get into it and you say, well, no, not entirely. There's This is tongue-in-cheek humor, but maybe you should. It's a very interesting read, I think, for both sexes. Let me ask you this. What is the Prince's program you speak about in your book? Uh, one of the key aspects of the book. The Princess program. When we raise our little human beings differently from one another, we get the Barbie Malibu Beach House with the pink-colored Corvette. Uh-oh. Sorry, that was my phone doing something strange. Um, well, we've got you still. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, so... The women are ganging up on us, EA. That's it, what it, it is. It will be. <laughs> Anyhow. The, My wife's uh, giving me a look right now that's like, <laughs> oh, wait till I get you off the air. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it, it really comes down to, you know, why aren't we creating um, our little human beings as little human beings, as, as opposed to creating them as little boys and little girls? Stereotypes. Um, yes. In other words, we, we indoctrinate them into these roles at a ridiculously early age. Um, these these young girls go to school, and they and then they experience that the prettiest girl with the prettiest dress and the prettiest shoes and the most dresses and the most shoes, and who lives in the best neighborhood, does better than the others. And the message that we're sending with that is popularity w will get you ahead in life. And yeah. unfortunately, there is a little bit of truth to that. Um, if we were to start um, working on who we are instead of what we'd like to grow up to be, because Let's face it, women, every woman on the planet cannot grow up to be, live in a Barbie dream house and have a pink Corvette. Amen. And but you know, the so, same is true, uh, EA, when it comes to men. You know, we raise boys the same way. I don't want to cut you off, but we are out of time, and I want to give you a chance to tell everybody where they can get your book. We have about 20 seconds. Okay, well, it's pretty simple, miscreant.eabarker.com, and there are a number of tabs on the website to direct you to your favorite bookstore and how to buy it. It's, uh, it is a fascinating, fun read uh, for both sexes. I think you'll enjoy the book. Thank you for your work and your perspective, EA, and for your willingness to share it with us, and, and thanks for your humor. We can all use a little more humor in our lives. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends. Let's have them join us as well. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, always remember, 
Believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.